Meals, excursions and drinks included, your next holiday could be on us. Choose any one of their 2025 Greek adventures and find your home at sea. We'll also send you packing with these luxury travel gifts. For a chance to win a prize worth over £20,000, text PRIZE to 63232. Text cost £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB04 PO Box 8690 Derby DE19 UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5 p.m. on the 26th of April. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if listening or watching on demand. Good luck. Are the newspapers getting you down? My wife didn't divorce me that month. <laughs> <laughs> Struggling to separate the wheat from the chaff. I know that it's a bit of a circus at the best of times. <laughs> well, don't worry. Headliners has got you covered. We'll take the burden of reading the day's news, and if we get depressed, who cares? It's an occupational hazard, frankly. That's Headliners on GB News from 11pm till midnight, and the following morning, 5 till 6am, on GB News, the comedy channel. Nah, just kidding. Britain's news channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. I'm Patrick Christie's. Every weeknight from nine, I bring you two hours of unmissable, explosive debate and headline-grabbing interviews. What impact has that had? We got death threats and the bomb threat and so on. Our job is to do what's in the best interests of our country. You made well, my I'm argument so... for no, me. My guests and I tackle the issues that really matter with a sharp take on every story. I'm hearing up and down the country that was a beginning, not an end. Patrick Christie's tonight from 9 p.m. only on GB News, Britain's news channel. On Patrick Christie's tonight, 9 till 11 p.m. The NEU's continue, is, we've also been looking at how we can uh, deal with some of the institutional racism that, de that does occur in education. The far left race obsessed head of the teachers' union about to lead teachers out on strike again. Also, we are taking more robust action than any other government before. But we're still stuck with rapists, paedophiles and murderers. I expose the rogues gallery of sick criminals that we can't or won't deport. And... <laughs> the man who fought against the London Bridge attacker says that Muslims have won the turf war for the control of Britain's prisons. Plus... Should Britain stop arming Israel after three Brits were killed in an IDF airstrike? And the world laughs at Hamza Yusuf as he's reported to police more times than J.K. Rowling. And I'll tackle all of tomorrow's newspaper front pages with my panel, director of Popular Conservatives, Mark Littlewood, businessman and activist Adam Brooks, and author and journalist Rebecca Reid. Oh, and terrifying scenes from Taiwan, although this man stayed remarkably calm. There he goes. Get ready, Britain. Here we go. I expose the rapists, paedophiles and murderers we won't deport. Next. From the GB Newsroom at 9 o'clock, I'm Sophia Wensler, your top story this hour. Shadow Foreign Secretary David Lammy says the government should suspend arms sales to Israel if it's clear that international law has been breached. It's after British aid workers John Chapman, James Henderson and James Kirby were killed when their convoy was hit by an Israeli airstrike while they were delivering vital food aid.
They were part of a group of seven aid workers from the, from the World Central Kitchen Organization. The charity's founder, Jose Andre, accused Israeli forces in Gaza of targeting the workers systematically car by car. Mr. Lamy says Britain cannot supply arms to Israel if it's proven to have broken international law. I have now been calling for 12 days for David Cameron to publish the legal advice so that we are clear on whether Israel has contravened international humanitarian law and therefore arms sales should be suspended. A new poll suggests Labour could sweep to victory with more than 400 seats at the next election, leaving the Tories with just 155. YouGov is predicting a landslide for Sakir Starmer, with the Conservatives projected to win even less seats than a previous poll conducted in January. And another change of leader may be off the cards, with other MPs, including Penny Mordaunt, Ian Duncan Smith and Jacob Rees-Mogg, all trailing their Labour challenges. And a teacher who described girls from Western backgrounds as lunatics has been banned from teaching indefinitely. An investigation found Akib Khan, who's from Birmingham, told students that those who support feminism would be replaced by Muslims. It's understood he also sent topless pictures of himself to messaging groups that included students. The Teaching Regulation Agency says Mr Khan engaged in serious misconduct and undermined what were described as fundamental British values. And for the latest stories, sign up to GB News Alerts by scanning the QR code on your screen or go to gbnews.com slash alerts. Now it's back to Patrick. Good evening. There is a rogues gallery of depraved foreign criminals that we can't or won't deport. There is the Albanian paedophile who rapes a 15-year-old schoolgirl. It looks like you're still paying the benefits for Jajin Jajiri. He lied his way into Britain by pretending to be from Kosovo. An immigration tribunal has concluded that it would be unfair to strip him of his British citizenship when evidence available almost 20 years ago was disregarded. Well, I think it's unfair that we have to live alongside this monster and pay for him. Then there's the Syrian Bedreddin brothers, jailed for being part of a grooming gang that raped and abused an underage girl. Yes, they have now been jailed, but we asked the Home Office if they'd deport them when they're released. They said it wasn't really their responsibility. We went to the Ministry of Justice. They referred us back to the Home Office. Classic. There's the members of the Rochdale grooming gang, Kari Ralph and Adil Khan. They were scheduled for deportation years ago, but we can't convince Pakistan to take them back. This is despite the UK giving Pakistan more than £1 billion in foreign aid since 2009. If that can't convince Pakistan to take these wrongans back, then what's the point? We're weak. Wabi Mohammed was jailed for his role in planning the 21-7 bombings, a failed attempt on July the 21st, 2005, to replicate those 7-7 bomb attacks, which killed 52 in London two weeks earlier. Can't get rid of him. Mohammed, a Somali immigrant, was released on bail in 2013. His lawyers have since used human rights laws to resist deportation. Nigerian child rapist Akin Shippe attacked a 13-year-old girl. He was due to be sent home after losing an appeal, after another appeal, in the British courts. But the European Court of Human Rights said this would breach his right to a private and family life. But it doesn't have to be this way. France ignored the ECHR and deported an Uzbek terrorist. They put him on a plane. He was gone. He was arrested on arrival. Sorted. No massive outcry. They just did it. Gambian national Joachim Cardos was jailed for eight years for rape and sentenced to a further three years for dealing cannabis. Now, he suddenly developed schizophrenia in prison, and despite us, get this, offering to give him enough medicine to last three months, plus £1,250 to buy further supplies of the prescription drugs he needed, he refused to go home. Well, all right, but then the judges said that we couldn't deport him either because it risks, quote, social isolation and stigmatisation in his own country. This man raped someone at knife point. What about her rights, OK? All of these people could be deported. We could ignore the ECHR. We could flex our international muscles when it comes to foreign aid. Our own domestic judges, people leading tribunals, could decide against them, couldn't they? This is a question of will, isn't it? We do not want to deport them. There will probably be hundreds, if not thousands, of these people, but we won't know 
Because, as it stands, the government is refusing to publish the data on how many asylum seekers or people with pending visa applications have committed violent or sexual crimes. It's always about their rights, OK? What about our right not to have to live with these monsters? Let's get the thoughts of my panel. This evening, I am joined by Director of Popular Conservatives, Mark Littlewood. I have got activist and businessman, Adam Brooks, and, of course, author and journalist, Rebecca Reid. Mark, I'll start with you. This is about pure will, isn't it? France are doing it. Why aren't we? It is basically about pure will, but it's also about our unbelievably complicated and contrived legal system, Patrick. We have put in place so many checks and balances and grounds for repeal, it is farcical. So if you are determined, and you've got a half-competent lawyer who is determined to gum up the process, you can gum up that process. We have got to get this an awful lot more streamlined. We've got to get tougher, I think, on what grounds are reasonable for deportation. By the way, I understand it's if you've uh, got a criminal offence that leads to 12 months in custody. Mm. So it, it, there's no magistrate's court, no criminal conviction would ever lead to you being kicked out of the country if you're not a British national. That's just too soft. But I think we've got to leave the ECHR convention. Otherwise, I'm afraid our own courts are going to keep gumming this up. Yeah, Adam, I mean, the latest one that we've had is this Albanian man who lied and pretended to be Kosovan. Mm. Uh, we've been paying his benefits, raped a 15-year-old girl, can't deport him. This story's horrific, and I, I was reading it earlier. He, he didn't just rape her, he took her off the street, put her in a, his car and raped her in the back of her, uh, his car. That is a monster. That person should not be on our streets. He shouldn't even be here. The fact that we cannot deport him, the fact that a tribunal turned around and said it would be unfair to deport him mm. is a disgrace. This country is weak. We have a weak government. We have weak civil servants and a home office. We have, you know, lefty lawyers that would rather the rights of a, a criminal be defended than the victim. We have Labour MPs that want to stop deportation flights. It's only going to get worse. And for the first time in my life, if I had enough money, I would take my children and take them to a safer country. This is a joke. Gosh, I mean, that's incredibly strong stuff. Rebecca, I mean, one of the issues is that people say, look, they should serve their sentence here. Now, I disagree with that, but I can see that side of things. But the problem, as far as I can see, is that once people have served a prison sentence here, we're still not deporting them. I think it depends what you want prison to do. So, in theory, prison should change and rehabilitate someone. So, this man clearly went into prison a monster and came out a monster. No remorse, doesn't care. He tried to claim this 15-year-old girl was a sex worker. That w wouldn't actually make a difference. Yeah. She could still have been raped if she were a sex worker. But anyway, he is clearly an evil man. Prison didn't work. Therefore, we're not talking about somebody who has changed or who is rehabilitated. But if somebody is a refugee, if somebody is here for good reason, then they are technically entitled to the same benefit of the doubt having gone through the prison system as a British citizen. So the gentleman who, stopped, who helped stop the terror attacks on London Bridge was a man who had been in prison for murder and who has turned his life around. We are supposed to... Have the option that... to deport him. That's the thing. That, no, no, is, that no. is the key difference. But what I'm saying is that is, a, though, but that is a good example that prison that people can redeem themselves. People can become good having done something evil. This man has clearly not done that. So we, I don't think we should blanket say anybody who commits a crime is not fixable. If you are a refugee who comes here and commits a crime, you should go through the prison system and you should be redeemed. That, that's a very worthy view, and I know a lot of people will have sympathy for that. But I think, unfortunately, I'm not saying this to be disrespectful. Sometimes I wonder if that's a bit naive. I mean, I have rattled off a huge number of people there that we are clearly unwilling to get rid of, uh, when, frankly, yeah. they're monsters. And th th there clearly is, or at least should be, a difference between how we treat British nationals and non-nationals, right? Why? Uh, well, I mean, there's nowhere to deport me to. Well, right? Shamima Begum if, was a British if, if national. You, if you choose... Shamima Begum was a British citizen. She's already out of the country now, to be to fair. Come into the, I mean, she was a very... But if you were on holiday, yeah, you're in you Mexico... Choose, well, then they should kick... If, if I'm on holiday and commit some ghastly crime, I wouldn't expect Spain, in your rather touching way, to say, we're going to spend ten years trying to make Martin Littlewood into a good person at our taxpayers' expense. I'd expect them to put me on the first flight back to London. I don't have a right to be but, in Spain or rely is, on their rehabilitation services. But that would services. be a really silly thing to do, because if you would... Let's take you out of it, because you seem like a man who wouldn't do a horrible thing. I certainly hope not. If, one, if a person commits a terrible crime in another country and they are then sent home and, they are, and we cannot be sure they will go to prison in their home country, what we've done is said, you've raised a teenager in this country, go back to another country and just do it again. Fine, you serve If somebody the... does it, you serve your sentence here. You serve here. the sentence here, 
and then you're straight on the plane. Because we've either more rehabilitated time, I have you, more time with that, we've either rehabilitated you, before or we you haven't. But you're not Let's remember, anymore. one of the reasons that he won't be deported is that he says he will be persecuted and he's in danger in Al Al Albania. Yet, He's waiting for a new passport, apparently, and he will go back to Albania. Visit his mum. Okay, okay, no, but we should clarify. So I, I... There are many people that are on asylum claims here that have been given asylum status that go back to the country that but apparently they're in why. danger so from. I totally understand why that's frustrating. I get it, but that's not technically why. The reason is that the incompetence in his original case 20 mm. years ago under a Tory happen. government was, is, is such that he cannot be... And, that and this undoable. leaves me on perfectly. So the, the, the his argument that, but his argument that he would be... That there are bad yeah. people, there is not but, but why. This, this leads me, but this leads me perfectly on to my follow-up question, which is, OK, one option, as we discussed would be either ignore or leave the ECHR. They have to leave the ECHR. France have been doing it. No massive fanfare about this in France. It is amazing. But if you leave the ECHR, you lose France, really so important protections so for British people. So you could people. ignore it. We put so our own one in place. OK, so you could ignore it, like France, like France yeah. have been doing. You're shaking your head about the idea of leaving the ECHR in, in the sense that we would lose stuff if we left the No, ECHR. no, I don't think no, we would lose me. stuff. That's entirely up to us, yeah. right? I, I'm in favour of us determining what British human rights are. We don't need a foreign court to do it. Exactly. I would rather not ignore it. I think we should have the courage of our convictions. If you're going to sign a document, stick to it. And if you think that document is no longer pertinent to your problems, exit we, it. But we we do ignore them. We do that. ignore them on foreign criminals in prison voting. Yeah. So it, they can be ignored, and they can make as much noise as they want. They can't do anything to but us. But there's other layers to this, which is not just the ECHR. It's not just government will, etc. Well, is there such a thing, Mark, as having too much law? Right. Yes. Is that? Because is that a bit what we're up against here? Now, everybody's human rights paramount. I know that if I was banging trouble, I would want a lawyer to use absolutely every single trick in the book to try and get me off. I think every single person would. But when you look at some of these cases and you think how easy it is to convince an immigration tribunal that some of these absolute animals should stay in Britain, it does make me question whether or not we have too much and, law. And too, many, too, too many checks and balances, there's mm. no doubt about that. There is an optimal number here. There is a Goldilocks sweet spot of it, not being too hot, not being too cold. But justice delayed is also justice denied. And right across our legal system, Patrick, not just asylum cases, it is taking too long to reach a judgment. Look at the post office scandal, for mm. example. Years before justice was served. So there is a trade off. You've got to make a decision relatively quickly, not in an impassioned sort of way, not on the flip of a coin, clearly not, but within a reasonable time frame. And the fact that it is taking us 18 months to even consider mm. an asylum application is f an absolute fiasco. And let's just remember, we've got thousands of these people arriving via dinghy every mm. month, and we do not know how many of them could be like this rapist or could be like a violent criminal. We have no idea. Well, as it sounds, we won't be told either, which is no. a problem. Mm. And, and, is a problem. And, 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 and as a father, I'm scared mm. for the future, and I, I'm not afraid to say that. This country, and I think under Labour... Yeah. The floodgates are going to open. Well, that, that I mean, the floodgates seem it. pretty open as they currently yeah. stand. Be I'm, much not more sure, open. I'm not really sure what you think is going to change okay. under Labour that will make busts. it worse. The dam busts do under Labour. There is no dam. Do you, do, do you think, though, that when it comes to human rights in this country, I mean, we've got things here like the case of the uh, Nigerian individual who developed schizophrenia in prison, was sent to a uh, mental asylum where they decided they could treat it with medication, sent back to prison. We then said to him, All right, you're going to be deported and uh, we even offered to pay for his medication for a period of time over there and then the judge said oh well, he, might, he might face stigmatization over there do you not think that maybe at some point in this discussion should be the right of the woman that he raped not mm. to have to bump into him on the street yeah of course but i think he probably should have remained in prison for the rest of his life i don't think he is somebody who was rehabilitated and i think until attitudes change you should stay there he clearly does not feel but is there is there a perverse way of looking at human rights here that don't always focus on the rights of the victim i think the difficulty is when you start playing with human rights you lose defenses for everybody and they are important for people in the round british citizens i think benefit more from the existence of human rights charters than they are inconvenienced by them okay just just one final one uh, i'll ask you to you mark um, we have returns agreements with certain countries ironically one of them is albania right we still can't get rid of this monster okay but that is a technicality on the law apparently which i know will bring everyone great comfort no doubt the 15 year old girl that he assaulted uh, but when it comes to other countries, so essentially, you know, most African nations or pretty much anywhere in the Middle East, we do not have returns agreements with 
We actually just could not deport. I mean, the only chance we've got of, of the 3,000 or so people a year that we do deport, the vast majority of them are European, yep, American, right. etc. You know, people that, that you know, we, we can get rid of. So yep. most people coming across on boats, for example, we wouldn't be able to get rid of anyway, no matter what they did as it currently stands. Well, this is why I think, in principle, the Rwanda policy is such an interesting idea. OK, it's not the most glorious country in the world, but it's hardly, you know, reckless and dangerous. Mm. And if you can get that to work, so if we can't send people back to their uh, 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 original country of origin, you can send them to Rwanda. But that seems to me a, a sensible... But why should Rwandan people have yeah. to live along... Do you not, can you not see that Rwanda are eventually going to well, be like, we don't the, want thousands of rapists in one place? The last the last thing thing want, government. Yeah. The last what a thing terrible thing for Rwanda to do to their... Some of these are the some of government. these left-wing yeah. MPs and activists, yeah, I think we should start housing some of these dangerous people or the, the, next to them and see how, how they act in the real world, because it's all right stopping these, these deportations, because they know it's not going to affect them. And this is one of the yeah. things that I have an issue with about the tribunal judges is how much are their lives potentially affected by some of the decisions that they make. But I suppose that, that is the, at all. That's the but system. But they're serving the law, that's what yeah. they do. It's the system we operate under. Look, thank you very much. Great start, everybody. Now, as Scottish coppers are swamped with 4,000 hate complaints in the first two days of the new hate crime laws, is the world now laughing at Hamza Yusuf? Olympic hero Inga Thompson joins me live to explain why she's willing to go to jail alongside J.K. Rowling in defence of women and free speech. But up next, as Rishi Sunak says he's appalled by the killing of three British aid workers by IDF forces, describing the situation in Gaza as intolerable, should the UK now stop arming Israel? Social policy uh, analyst... Uh, no, sorry, that's wrong. Chairman of the National Jewish Assembly, Gary Mond, goes head-to-head -head with Aaron Bastard. And that is next. Good afternoon, Britain. Weekdays from midday. Are our relationships with foreign countries actually undermining free speech on a day to day basis in our universities? Well, it's very good to be with you. It's difficult to form a, a kind of clear conclusion because, as we know, universities are much, much more reliant on international fees than they used to be. We are seeing some sort of troubling developments, particularly at the level of admissions criteria. We're seeing quite stark and, frankly, scandalous disparities in the admissions criteria for domestic students as against foreign students in some universities. And so part of the problem is that the financial incentive structures um, are such that uh, universities risk becoming more and more dependent upon foreign regimes um, because they're simply bringing in an awful lot more money. Um, yeah, James, these... of course, this, this, uh, all of this discussion, we say countries, 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 uh, frankly, mainly we're really looking at one country, aren't we? China. Well, China is certainly a, a, a focus. I mean, nearly one in three undergraduate students uh, from overseas at Russell Group universities are from, were from China in 2021. 60% of overseas postgraduates uh, come from China. Uh, we know from uh, the FBI and the Five Eyes security chiefs that um, China is a, a master at intellectual property theft. Uh, and of course, there's a whole range of human rights issue concerns over Taiwan, Tibet, Uyghur Muslims, uh, lockdown tyranny. I mean, all of these are issues about which, you know, researchers and academics should be free to teach. Uh, and question and in universities where there is a heavily heavy commercial reliance uh, on regimes uh, like China, there are obvious uh, wow. disincentives to uh, uh, ensuring that academics and, and students are free to speak their mind on those issues. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel.
Are the newspapers getting you down? My wife didn't divorce me that month. <laughs> Struggling to separate the wheat from the chaff. I know that it's a bit of a circus at the best of times. <laughs> well, don't worry. Headliners has got you covered. We'll take the burden of reading the day's news, and if we get depressed, who cares? It's an occupational hazard, frankly. That's Headliners on GB News from 11pm till midnight, and the following morning, 5 till 6am, on GB News, the comedy channel. Nah, just kidding. Britain's news channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. Welcome back to Patrick Christie's Tonight. Shortly, an Olympic hero joins me to explain why she is willing to go to jail with J.K. Rowling for women's rights, as the world laughs at Hamza Youssef. But first, should the UK stop arming Israel? It's time now for a Head to Head. Well, the deaths of three British aid workers in Gaza are continuing to spark international condemnation, with Rishi Sunak demanding an urgent investigation and labelling the situation in the Middle East increasingly intolerable. Josh Chapman, James Henderson and James Kirby were working as security advisers for the charity World Central Kitchen when the vehicles they were travelling in were specifically targeted in three separate Israeli missile strikes on Monday night. That's despite the convoy following an Israeli Defence Force-approved route and using GPS trackers and SOS beacons to broadcast their position. The tragedy, which Israel's Benjamin Netanyahu has said was unintended, has led to calls for the UK to stop arming Israel with £42 million worth of British weapons sent to the country in 2022. Just yesterday, pro-Palestine activists climbed onto the roof of a Yorkshire factory in protest over its production of weapons for Israel. So, after the death of three British aid workers, should the UK stop arming Israel? Let me know your thoughts. Email me gbviews at gbnews.com. Tweet me at gbnews. While you're there, go and vote in our poll. The results will follow shortly. But doing battle on this now, the co-founder of Navarra Media, Aaron Bastani, and the chairman of the National Jewish Assembly, Gary Mon. Chaps, thank you very, very much. Look, Gary, I'll start with you. Should we stop arming Israel? Absolutely not. Clearly, the deaths of the charity workers are an absolute tragedy and they should be fully investigated. They are being fully investigated. And I gather in the last couple of hours there's been news that the Israeli government will be compensating the families of the victims. However, the issue of arming Israel is a different one. Israel is fighting an entirely just war against genocidal terrorists who on the 7th of October murdered 1,400 people, beheading babies, massacring innocent people and raping women. They have to be literally wiped off the face of the earth. Everything should be done to enable Israel to defeat Hamas. And if anything, it should be more weapons rather than less to help Israel. Oh, and by the way, there's, there's also traffic, arms traffic in the opposite direction. Israel is supplying the UK with a lot of arms as well. Mm. OK, uh, all right, Aaron. A compelling arguments, I would say, there from Gary, your views. Well, I don't quite understand what the losses that Israel uh, was subjected to on October 7th have to do with three UK nationals, of course, being killed in recent days. I want to cast your audience's mind back to the 19th century, 1847. There was a gentleman in Athens called David Pacifico. He was Jewish, as a matter of fact. And his house was vandalised by a Greek anti-Semitic mob. He asked for money back from the Greek government at the time. They wouldn't give him the money back. It was King Otto. And so he wrote, as a British subject, he was born in Gibraltar to the British government. Lord Palmerston makes representations to the Greek government, nothing happens. And so the British Navy, the Royal Navy, blockaded the Athens harbour for two months until they paid up. And he made an extraordinary speech in the House of Commons, saying that a British subject should feel just as a Roman citizen did in the ancient mm. world. I am a British subject, or Kivis Romanos Sum, uh, 2,000 years ago. And I find it absolutely extraordinary that we've moved so far back in 1,500 years or 1,700 years that somebody's house could be burglarized and it led to a blockade of a country's harbor. Mm -hmm. And yet in the 2020s, three of our people can die and the instinctive response from the political class is okay. hope and prayers, hashtags, maybe a round of applause. And 
Israel should investigate itself. Okay. It's utterly astounding. If the UK and its military had killed three Israeli nationals, Benjamin Netanyahu would have kicked our ambassador out by tea time and he would have been quite right to do so. OK, uh, Gary, I suppose, look, to paraphrase what Aaron's saying there, and I hope I'm not doing a disservice, it, essentially it looks as though the British government doesn't care enough about the British nationals who've died, maybe. Look, what has happened was a tragedy. I don't, I don't doubt that. But if, if the converse happened, if three Israeli nationals had been killed and it was clearly an accident and it had been investigated and it was seen that there, there was no ill harm, no ill intent in the, ac in the action, that it was an accident, mm. I don't believe the Israeli ambassador will be expelled. No way. And it's the same in the other way around here, because tragically and sadly, these three British nationals have been killed. There will be an investigation. There will be compensation paid. And we need to move on and realise that the issue of the war that's happening is a far bigger issue. It affects everyone. It affects not Jewish people. It affects non-Jewish people. Hamas has to be eliminated for what it did and for what it stands for. All right, Aaron, look, it was a mistake during a war. Well, those three families of these three gentlemen, ex-service personnel, they're not going to move on. And no amount of compensation that comes forward from Tel Aviv is going to be enough for them losing their three sons. Look at these guys. In the, in the summer of their lives, they had a great deal to offer, uh, ex-service personnel, like I say, and they were presumably working as security for an NGO in, in Gaza, doing extraordinary work, feeding people mm. in a humanitarian crisis. The absolute best of this country, and they're being let down, in my opinion, by the absolute worst, which is expressed in the leadership of both the Conservative and the Labour parties. Uh, we shouldn't rush to judgment, of course, but I would um, look at a, a source no less than Haaretz, the most read newspaper in Israel, which has quoted IDF sources themselves as saying the reason why this happened is because nobody is in charge on the ground. That's what they have said. So there were three vehicles struck. This was in a de-conflicted uh, zone. Okay. on an agreed route. They'd already dropped the food off at the depot. They were going back. Um, they had agreed, like I said, this route with the IDF. Three vehicles were struck three different times. After the first vehicle was struck, allegedly, according to Haaretz again, this is an mm. Israeli newspaper, they radioed through to the IDF and the other two vehicles were still struck and nonetheless. Now, you might call that an accident. I would, I would submit it was something else. But the point is, I question anyone who wishes to rush to judgment in excusing the country responsible. And like I say, no amount of compensation is going to bring these three gentlemen mm. back. Uh, OK, G Gary, do you want to come back to it? Because, because, look, you know, maybe you should explain why it's in Britain's interests to continue to arm Israel. I mean, you know, if three British citizens have just died in, in this way, what, why is it in our interest to keep doing this? It's in our interest because the war against Hamas is a war against Islamic fundamentalism. It is also in our interest to take seriously the threat from Iran and from other combatants who wish to push the entire issue of fundamentalist Islam on the West. Hamas is just the baby example, but we have to start somewhere and we have to get rid of Hamas. OK, I mean, Aaron, look, hey, this wouldn't have happened if Hamas hadn't have committed the October 7 attacks. As Gary is saying there, this is in a wider geopolitical interest to Britain. We should continue to arm Israel. Well, I just disagree. Britain has some leverage in this conversation, and that is the arms it sells to Israel. We have a massive arms company in this country, hugely successful BAE systems. And I think at least, at the very least, Patrick, at the very least, a temporary suspension. There have been 200 humanitarian workers who've been killed. Three have been British. The idea that they may have been killed with British weapons is absolutely extraordinary. Even a tap on the wrist, Patrick, two months of no arms going to Israel seems to me to be the bare minimum, the absolute bare minimum. And like I say, that example we have from the 1850s of um, what Lord Palmerston did to the Greeks, how far has this country fallen? And my goodness, what would Palmerston make of it all? Mm. OK, look, both, both of you, thank you very, very much. I mean, definitely both sides of that particular discussion. I know those conversations will be happening, you know, at pubs up and down the country and around people's dinner tables this evening as we all uh, absorb that news. Look, thank you. That was the co-founder of Navarro Media, Aaron Bastani, and the chairman of the National Jewish Assembly, Gary Mon. Look, who do you agree with?
OK, I was asking you whether or not you should actually be continuing to arm Israel. Aaron says, yes, 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 we should. There should be a ceasefire. Uh, enough with this madness. Too many people uh, are suffering because our leaders want to argue. David says, uh, no, we shouldn't stop arming them. You don't change policy due to a single unfortunate error. Imagine if we'd just given up like that in World War II. Israel is close to defeating Hamas. Support them until they get the job done. Let your verdict is in. So 30% of you think that the UK should stop arming Israel. 70% of you say we shouldn't. So there we go. Coming up, Angela Rayner's ex and deselected Labour MP has declared war on Keir Starmer over what he calls dirty tricks in the MP selection process. Is this a sign of the chaos and civil war about to come under Labour? Former Conservative Minister Anne Whittacombe weighs in shortly, but first I speak to the Olympic hero who's willing to go to jail with J.K. Rowling. And it is official, OK? The whole world is now laughing at Hamza Youssef. And I'll explain why very, very shortly. Inga Thompson is live, and that's next. Hello again and welcome to your latest GB News weather update. Well, there will be some further heavy rain first thing across southern areas, but in general, Thursday offers some much drier weather compared to the wet weather we've seen recently. Northeastern areas have suffered the most with the rain throughout today. That rain will clear away through tonight, but the next batch arrives into the southwest. We'll see two bursts of rain. This one will turn heavy at first in the southwest, but as it pushes into parts of northern England, it will turn a little bit dry, but most areas will see some heavy outbreaks of rain through the night. Further north and west though it should stay dry and we could see a touch of frostbite tomorrow morning but it's in the southwest tomorrow morning where the heaviest rain will be and that will push into parts of Wales, the Midlands, into the southeast throughout the rush hour. So if you are moving about on Thursday morning expect some tricky travelling conditions. Once that does clear out the way we'll see a mix of sunshine and showers for many areas of England and Wales. There will be some decent sunny spells in between that will feel fairly pleasant in that sunshine but further north it's going to considerably drier day than it has been lately. We'll see highs of around 10 or 11 degrees across northwestern areas. It's still cold though in the far north of Scotland and as the next batch of rain bumps into that cold air on Friday morning there's a risk of some snow across the highlands and Grampians and we'll see outbreaks of quite heavy rain push through many northern areas throughout Friday. Further south though it turns drier as the day goes on but the weekend is looking unsettled and seasonably windy but exceptionally mild. That's all for now. Bye-bye. I'm Martin Daubney, this is GB News, Britain's news channel. Martin Daubney, weekdays from 3pm. SUV drivers in Oxford will face higher parking charges, proposals tabled by the local Green Party or passed by the City Council. The motion argues that heavier cars like SUVs cause more damage to roads, are more likely to seriously injure or kill pedestrians, and cause more illnesses due to pollution. However, the Alliance of British Drivers has condemned the plan as absolutely outrageous. Well, let's get the thoughts now of the legendary motoring journalist, Quentin Wilson. Quentin, welcome to the show. Always a pleasure. We hear a lot about the war on motorists, this time targeting SUVs because of their weight and the Chargers could be astronomical. This idea first started in Paris, now it's coming to Oxford. Can you tell us a bit about how it would work? OK, so the idea is that the, the, the charges will penalise people who drive heavier SUVs, and I guess by implication electric cars, although Oxford Council haven't said exactly what they're going to do with, with EVs. But this is all based around this notion of, of, of SUVs being heavier than passenger cars, therefore wearing out the roads more. Now, there was a study, I've got it here in front of me, from the University of Edinburgh in 2022, that said... Um, Real world tests found that overwhelmingly the wear is caused by large vehicles, buses, heavy good vehicles. Road wear from cars and motorcycles is so low that this is immaterial. Now, obviously, driving around a medieval city like Oxford in an SUV isn't the brightest thing in the world to do. But the idea that we should penalize the owners of these cars based on imperfect science that's been read on social media, I think is completely wrong. Welcome back. Coming up, have Labour been rigging votes? But first, 
Police Scotland have been swamped by almost 4,000 complaints within just days of the SNP's chilling new hate crime bill coming into force. They say that they have to investigate every single one. This comes amid soaring crime rates in Scotland, a record 71,000 incidents of violent crime recorded last year, and with a meagre 16,600 police officers, Police Scotland's resources are at their lowest level since the force was formed. On top of that, it's emerged today that Scottish First Minister Hamza Yusuf has been targeted with more hate crime complaints than J.K. Rowling over a speech he made in 2020. So the SNP have turned Scotland into a global laughing stock. High-profile celebrities like Elon Musk, so arguably the richest man in the world, Joe Rogan, who's, I think, the biggest podcaster in the world, and J.K. Rowling, the best-known author in the world, are all lining up to ridicule his new laws. Well, Olympic cycling hero and women's rights warrior Inga Thompson has added her voice. And I'm very pleased to say she joins me now. Inga, thank you very, very much. Now, you are prepared to go to quite extreme lengths to show your solidarity with J.K. Rowling, aren't you? Do you want to talk us through it? Yes, I think I made the comment that I would happily go to jail for J.K. Rowling and or for, for what we're fighting for with women's rights. And I think it's really important that, that this has been highlighted because we need to see the attack that's happening on women. And this is happening on so many different layers and levels. Like, uh, I was threatened last year for... Um, just saying, calling a man a biological male when we were talking about sports. And I was told if I came back to France by Sandra Fautain, who is a transgender athlete there, that she would report me for a hate crime and I would be jailed. I've been turned into safe sport for basically stating biological male when it comes to sports. And so this is happening at every layer and level um, to women like me that don't have the voice like some of these famous people do. So watching this hate crime, crime come through um, is disturbing. And yet at the same time, I think that it's good because it's getting out there in public uh, the attack on human, um, on women's rights. Like right now, trans rights mm. have every rights that, that everybody else have. We have sex separated rights for women for a reason. Yeah. And we're trying to protect that. And I think it's remarkable, actually, to realise how far this has gone. Now, it's worth noting that if the Police Scotland are saying that they're going to investigate every single report of a hate crime, then conceivably the current First Minister of Scotland has around 1,800 active investigations <laughs> against himself, which is, by any stretch of the imagination, completely bonkers. Normally politicians are asked to resign if they have one, but there we go. Maybe that just, just demonstrates <laughs> how completely futile he actually views his own law to be. But this has gone global, hasn't it? Can I ask, what is... You, how did you come to hear of this? And, and has this, you know, shocked you about Scotland? This is going on in the UK. No, it hasn't shocked me at all. We've been watching this going on for years, that, that it has become a hate crime for women to ask for our own sex-separated sex spaces. And by calling a biological male a male, we're being, you know, threatened. We're being called transphobic and white supremacist and... Nazi and fascist and bigot. And I mean, the list goes on. And when you don't have an argument, you start throwing out slurs and the women are standing up to this. We're standing strong. And so the next thing that comes around is you're going to throw us in jail for speaking biology, for speaking about our, our sex separated spaces. It, it, it's laughable. And, and I'm looking at your, your man that, that, wanted to put this through. So what's the comment uh, hung by your own petard mm. here that he puts this out and yet he's the one that has the most <laughs> uh, yeah. most hate crimes going out against him. Yeah. Um, it's, let me just let, let, let me just play to you one one clip and I'll come back to you. So, so this is this is the man of the moment, isn't it? This is Hamza Yusuf, okay? So this is some of his comments about his own ridiculous hate crime bill, all right? The only concern you should have when it comes to the new stirring up of hate, the new stirring up offences is if your behaviour is threatening or abusive and intends to stir up hatred. And, and by the way, even if that is the case, there are some defences, such as a reasonable person defence and so on and so forth. So unless your behaviour is threatening or abusive and intends to stir up hatred, then you have nothing to worry about in terms of the new offences being created. Do you believe that? No, not, in, not for a moment, because every law can, is up for interpretation. And when you come up against this, when you just say biological male, they're calling it a hate crime. And to state a truth, to state a fact, can now be considered mm. 
a hate crime. And that is the problem with this bill is that it will be taken to another level to silence women. Mm. And that's what we're seeing here. And there's already been the threat with the JK and then they've decided for whatever reason, they're not going to pursue it, but it will be pursued. Maybe they just don't want to go after JK. You think it will be, it will be the little people. You get done. Yeah, it, it'll be people like me. I've already been threatened with this. Mm. And and we're, we're seeing this more and more even in the United States. And so it's going to be the people like me that will be threatened. And we're watching it on every layer possible. You know, um, we're watching nurses get threatened for stating biological facts. We're watching all the women athletes get, you know, threatened. Um, I've been warned by Safe Sport to not call a biological male a biological uh, male. Mm. Can, can I just on that? Because look, you, I mean, it's hard to, I haven't really got the right words to describe how, how good of an athlete you, you were, right? But what, what, whatever you want to say, I mean, elite doesn't quite do it justice. But conceivably, conceivably, if you were around now, you might get beaten in your own category by a man, right? And how serious an issue is that? Because some people would say, Oh, well, you know, if that person lives as a woman or, or if they look a little bit like a woman. I know that there's, there's someone who presents a, a, a show on this channel who remarkably thinks that as long as the lady is petite enough, then it doesn't really... The man, I should say, is petite enough, then it doesn't really matter. Uh, why, why is this the kind of thing that you would go to prison for? Because right now what we're seeing is that, specifically in sports, that once a male goes through full male puberty, there's no uncooking the eggs. There's no undoing this. They will always have a male advantage. And even if you take away all of their testosterone, mm. they're just now a man with male advantage with low testosterone. And when you look within men, uh, men can compete anywhere between 300 to 600 nanomoles per liter where women are competing under two nanomoles per liter. But once they've gone through the, the puberty process, the male advantage, it never goes away. And they're showing that with athletes, if they continue to train, there is zero reduction in the male advantage that they carry that they've gotten through puberty. And so, and, and when, when you ask me the question about why go to jail for this, the reason why I have the opportunities that I do as a woman is because of generations of women before me that have fought for my rights and they have gone to jail and they've been beaten and they've been told to be quiet. And, you know, you look at our, our um, the women's right to vote, the women's right for abortion, the women's, you know, everything just here in the States, everything that my grandmothers before me fought for, mm. many of them went to jail. And so if that's what it takes to continue for women to have equal opportunities, uh -huh. I'm willing to, to put my hand up and say I will fight well, for women. Uh, I said one day, if you ever get off a plane at Edinburgh Airport or wherever in Scotland, I would happily uh, be there to meet you. I don't think uh, Hamza Youssef or indeed any other man has a right to tell you what you can and can't say about uh, your own biological gender. That's Inga Thompson there. Thank you very, very much, Olympic cyclist. Now, speaking on Monday, of course, Hamza Youssef did defend that bill, but we've already heard from him there. Coming up, more chaos as school children beckons. Get this, so 90% of teachers back a fresh walkout over pay. So another school strike, just in time for the end of the summer holidays, by the way. But look at this bloke who's whipping them up into a frenzy. It's about time we globalise the Intifada! Yeah! I expose the National Education Union's militant leader and explain why things will only get worse shortly. But next, deselected Labour MP and notably Angela Rayner's ex-boyfriend, Sam Tarry, is ramping up his two-year-long battle against Labour HQ for what his allies are calling dirty tricks in the selection process. Is this a sign of the chaos to come under Labour? Will Sama be able to control the increasingly vocal, hard left? Former Conservative Minister Anne Whittacombe gives her views, and she's next. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. I see what you've been saying at home. You're very oh. vexed about these China cyber attacks. Colin says, what the hell is our Secret Service doing? They've only just realised what China's up to. You just couldn't make it up. We could have told we you. We knew. <laughs> we knew. We're not surprised. So quite uh. what the
Colin, we agree with you. Quite why it's taken GCHQ or MI6 or whatever it is, MI5, it would be MI5 yeah. to know what's going on. And Rod has said, thank you, Rod, if you know how you vote, if they know how you vote, coupled with mass data held also on you, you do, do you not believe they can influence your decision-making process in any way? I'm not but sure. they won't know. I'm not sure they know how you they vote because that. that's... That's that, not on record anyway, no, is it? it is not. Um, and Ken says these are only able to be carried out because of computers, internet, mobile phones, etc. It seems to me that these inventions are ruining our lives and therefore we were much safer and much happier without these inventions. There is a school of thought that would agree with that, Ken, very oh, much I so. I sort of often think it myself, really. Me I mean, too. I mean, I... The, the, the dark web... I mean, yeah. how many people have been murdered because of the dark web? You do wonder as Brianna, well. Brianna Jai. Yeah, you do wonder. I look at my kids' generation and I wonder whether they will grow up and have a complete rejection of all of this and they will just say, enough, because they will think we were all insane for having become so addicted to our phones. Mm. I wonder whether, as a generation after generation do, they will reject it. Wayne, blame Western governments for the rise of China. People were saying this ten years ago and every country ignored it. That is a really good point, mm. Wayne, because we've taken Chinese investment and obviously our houses are full of items we well, bought from made and, in and China. And if you remember as well, we had to get them out of the 5G. Why are we? We did. Take, get them out, get, literally extricate them. Yeah, from that us. was at least one thing I think they did quite well. Yeah. And Jan says if they've seen the electoral roll, what else have they been looking at? That's the threat to our democracy. They never do things by halves. I'm much more worried about my own government looking at what I do online. To be fair. The point is, though, go back. We said before the electoral roll is a do public document which you can access if you go to your library. Mm. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and, of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other, which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria Di Piero, bringing you... PMQ's live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister, and we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. Welcome back. Still to come, I hit back at the Marxist Union Baron feeding hard left propaganda into our schools. But first, it's time for Anne Whittaker. Now, former Shadow Transport Minister Sam Tarry was deselected as an MP by local Labour members in Ilford South over a year ago. But now he's accused the Labour Party of vote rigging. And he's lodged a formal complaint to the party over his failed reselection attempts. The Terry campaign alleges that during door to door visits, they discovered a suspiciously high number of people were not living at the addresses that they were registered to on the membership system, even finding discrepancies at a home owned by his rival and eventual winner of the hustings, Jazz Athwell. Terry also claims that the party's online voting system has been used to disadvantage left wing candidates. So the Anony Voter software is now being investigated by police after a similarly chaotic selection process in Croydon East last year. Anne, welcome to the show. Look, a lot of people have occasionally lazily wheeled out the trope of vote rigging amongst Labour or certainly when it comes to things like postal votes. But hang on a minute. Does this need to be looked into now? Yes, it does. I mean, uh, Tarry has come up with some extremely clear evidence. He hasn't just made wild allegations into the air. Um, he's had a team that have actually gone door to door. Um, they found out a, a, a lot of discrepancies. Um, they are therefore presenting those discrepancies as fact. Uh, and so, yes, it certainly needs looking into. I would not like to, uh, you know, make a judgment as to the outcome at this point. Mm. But it, similarly, with the, you know, all the stuff that there is about postal votes, which is much more important because it's a, you know, general election or a by-election or whatever it might be, all the fuss uh, over postal votes, um, it's high time also that somebody took one area where there are a lot of allegations and made a thorough, thorough analysis of that as well. It's especially prevalent 
or at least it's suspected to be anyway, in, in university cities and towns where there is a high turnover of people living at multiple different addresses over the course of, say, their three- or four-year course. And for a long time, it has been suspected that this could be a good way of farming and using votes. And in your view, let's not rush to judgment in this particular case, but what could the problem be, OK? How could it be done? What could be going on? Well, uh, what could be going on is that there could be some organised vote rigging uh, whereby uh, votes are being collected uh, on the basis of false information, that somebody maybe doesn't even live in the area but lives somewhere else. Um, now, that would be, you know, pretty serious stuff. And as I say, I can't judge the outcome of this, but I do know that there is sufficient um, evidence there or sufficient pre presentation of fact there um, that it does warrant being thoroughly looked into, not just uh, glanced at, but looked into. And the irony would be that after countless Tory MPs and Conservative ministers have desperately tried to raise this issue, it may well end up being brought to a head by a bloke who's regarded as being on the left of, well, formally anyway, the Labour Party. I'm just going to read a, spokes, uh, a statement from a spokesperson out now from the Labour Party. The Labour Party has full confidence in the integrity of the South Ilford selection process. We always investigate concerns that are raised in relation to candidate selections, and we reject the allegations that have been made. A Guido Fawkes exclusive has revealed how Labour's new First Minister of Wales, Anne Vaughan Gething, decided to swan off on holiday to Spain without even spending a full day in the office or holding his first meeting with his new cabinet. And is this a bad look now for the Welsh national leader, a sign maybe of how little they care? I don't think we should get too uptight about this. Probably, if you look at it, you'll find that he'd book that trip to Spain donkey years ago, uh, probably not going on his own, probably going with family or others that he doesn't want to let down. Even politicians have to have holidays. Uh, and then, of course, the bad luck comes along uh, that there's a, a, a clash. Now, mm. um, you know, I personally think he should have put his duty first rather than his holiday, but there are others who would say the opposite. I'm not not going to get worked up about that. It ain't as important as vote rigging. No way. It's not as important as the potential vote rigging. No, just just on that. Do you, do you think? I mean, if Labour are essentially investigating that, those vote rigging allegations themselves, I mean, is that good enough? Is this the kind of thing that needs a needs a kind of proper police investigation? No, it's no good for them to mark their own homework. Mm. Uh, and indeed, if they have an investigation, they have been into it thoroughly. Let them give that to the police and say, here is our response. And let the police see if it was a proper investigation. That's the point, isn't it? That is the point. Then come on, then show us your papers. Let's yeah. show us the homework that you marked. Again, what is that? If there's nothing to hide, I mean, remarkable, isn't it? Um, just going to just going to quickly whiz you through another story because it ties in a little bit with the story I'm doing at the top of uh, the next hour. The one I'm doing at the top of the next hour is about, and people might have missed this, kids being. Uh, taken out of school, essentially, by a hard-left Marxist pro-Palestine individual. But a new poll has now revealed that nearly three-quarters of GPs working for the NHS want to go on strike, citing concerns over pay, funding and workload. They're rumoured to be targeting the expected autumn election. Classic. So the BMA are right behind them with their GP committee chairwoman saying, today we start the fight back, bringing our patients with us because patients want access to their family doctor in a surgery that feels safe with a well-resourced team ready to meet the needs for our communities. Look, Anne, is this just political? Oh, I mean, first of all, GPs should not be allowed to strike full stop. I mean, they are responsible for people's lives. They are responsible for people's health and welfare. No way should they be allowed to strike. Um, you know, the police can't. I see no reason why GPs should be allowed to strike. That is the first thing. Yet nobody will have the guts to get to grips with that. It makes me yearn for a latter-day Mrs Thatcher. Uh, but, you know, you look far and wide in the current government to find that. Uh, and uh, But uh, it, it's immoral. I mean, there is no other word for it. What they are doing is immoral. Now, it may also be political. Yes, they want to make life difficult for the Conservative government. It may also be political. But largely, it's just plain selfish. Uh, they will put people's welfare at risk for the sake mm. of their pay packet. Well, you talk about their pay packets. The stats I've got here is, is, is worth reminding our viewers and listeners that apparently the majority of British GPs are, are partners with an average earnings of 153 grand a year for, in some cases, a three-day week. So, you know, the viewers and listeners will be able to make up their own minds there. And thank you very, very much. And, and if she is still there and able to hear me, I just wanted to say, Anne, I absolutely loved you covering for Jacob Rees-Mogg the other night. But coming up... 
As London Bridge attack hero Steve Gallant says that Muslims have won the turf war between prison gangs, are our jails now becoming jihadi training grounds? We get stuck into that. Plus, I'm about to expose the hard-left, race-baiting union chief leading teachers into another walkout over pay. This man is putting politics ahead of your child's future, and that's next. That warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers. Sponsors of Weather on GB News. Hello again and welcome to your latest GB News weather update. Well, there will be some further heavy rain first thing across southern areas, but in general, Thursday offers some much drier weather compared to the wet weather we've seen recently. Northeastern areas have suffered the most with the rain throughout today. That rain will clear away through tonight, but the next batch arrives into the southwest. We'll see two bursts of rain. This one will turn heavy at first in the southwest, but as it pushes into parts of northern England, it will turn a little bit dry, but most areas will see some heavy outbreaks of rain through the night. Further north and west though it should stay dry and we could see a touch of frostbite tomorrow morning but it's in the southwest tomorrow morning where the heaviest rain will be and that will push into parts of Wales, the Midlands, into the southeast throughout the rush hour. So if you are moving about on Thursday morning expect some tricky travelling conditions. Once that does clear out the way we'll see a mix of sunshine and showers for many areas of England and Wales. There will be some decent sunny spells in between that will feel fairly pleasant in that sunshine but further north it's going to considerably drier day than it has been lately. We'll see highs of around 10 or 11 degrees across northwestern areas. It's still cold though in the far north of Scotland and as the next batch of rain bumps into that cold air on Friday morning there's a risk of some snow across the highlands and Grampians and we'll see outbreaks of quite heavy rain push through many northern areas throughout Friday. Further south though it turns drier as the day goes on but the weekend is looking unsettled and seasonably windy but exceptionally mild. That's all for now. Bye-bye. Looks like things are heating up. Boxed Boilers, sponsors of weather on GB News. With thanks to Variety Cruises, a family company sailing since 1942, you have the chance to win a £10,000 seven-night small boat cruise for two. With flights, meals, excursions and drinks included, you'll be able to choose from any one of their 2025 Greek adventures and explore Greece like never before. Plus, you'll also win £10,000 in tax-free cash to make your summer sizzle. And we'll pack you off with these luxury travel gifts. For a chance to win a prize worth over £20,000, text PRIZE to 63232. Text costs £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB04 PO Box 8690 Derby DE1 9 T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on the 26th of April. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if listening or watching on demand. Good luck. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels, we're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. It's 10 p.m. I'm Patrick Christie's tonight. Getting you continue. We've also been looking at how we can uh, deal with some of the institutional racism that, that does occur in education. The far left pro Palestine teachers union leader making your child suffer. Also. The man who fought against the London Bridge attacker says Islamist prison gangs have won the war behind bars. They've taken over and 
Should Britain stop arming Israel after three Brits were killed in an IDF airstrike? Plus... Councils failing local residents. If you live in a Labour council area, you pay more council tax. You're more likely to have to wait behind non-British nationals for social housing. Well, the Tories are calling out Labour for letting migrants skip the housing waiting list and... <laughs> Do we need a new minister for flags? I've got all of tomorrow's newspaper front pages today with the director of Popular Conservatives, Mark Littlewood, businessman and activist Adam Brooks and author Rebecca Reed. Oh, and this man caused in the Taiwan earthquake. Was he brave or stupid? Get ready, Britain, here we go. Hard left Marxist radicals are coming for your kids. Next. Good evening. I'm Sophia Wenzel in the GB Newsroom. Your top story this hour. Shadow Foreign Secretary David Lammy says the government should suspend arms sales to Israel if it's clear that international law has been breached. It's after British aid workers John Chapman, James Henderson and James Kirby were killed when their convoy was hit by an Israeli airstrike while they were delivering vital food aid. They were part of a group of seven aid workers from the World Central Kitchen Organization. The charity's founder, Jose Andre, has accused Israeli forces in Gaza of targeting the workers systematically. Seven team members between the special specialty security people we have three British individuals and three, uh, three international crew plus one Palestinian, that they were targeted systematically, car by car. In other news, a new poll suggests Labour could sweep to victory with more than 400 seats at the next election, leaving the Tories with just 155. YouGov is predicting a landslide for Sakir Starmer, with the Conservatives projected to win even less seats than a previous poll conducted in January. And another change of leader may be off the cards, with other MPs, including Penny Mordaunt, Ian Duncan-Smith and Jacob Rees-Mogg, all trailing their Labour challenges. Questions are being asked about how a 43-year-old man was able to commit two sex attacks years apart despite receiving a jail sentence. Fareed Issa Tariq will spend 18 years in prison for raping a woman in Swindon after he tricked her into accepting a ride in a fake taxi. He was previously jailed in 2012 for a near-identical crime. And one in 20 people who try to book GP appointments over the telephone are told to call back another day. That's according to a major new survey. It found that a third of people in England who have tried to book an appointment in the last month say they've struggled to speak to someone. More than one in 10 of those who calls were answered were told they need to wait for more than two weeks. And among those who eventually did get an appointment, 20% reported having a poor experience. And a religious charity is warning the Scottish government against banning conversion therapy for LGBT people. The Christian Institute says the proposal is too broad and risks punishing what it calls harmless behaviour. But the Scottish government has rejected the claim, saying the proposed law would only apply where there's a clear intention to suppress someone's sexuality. A survey found that 7% of LGBT people in Scotland have been subjected to or offered conversion therapies. And for the latest stories, sign up to GB News Alerts by scanning the QR code on your screen or go to gbnews.com slash alerts. Now it's back to Patrick. Good evening. Teachers look set to go on strike again just in time for the new school year. 90% of teachers back a walkout over pay in a ballot conducted by the National Education Union. Now, the head of the NEU is this man, Daniel Kabidi. He said this, I would say there is a mood of desperation, if we're being honest. The profession is very much on its knees. Morale is at an all-time low. The government is continually missing its recruitment targets for new teachers. We missed it by 50% for secondary teachers this year. Quite simply, if we continue on this direction of travel, education will grind to a halt. Fine. But let's have a little look at who this guy is, shall we? He's a far-left, pro-Palestine, questionably race-baiting activist. He was elected to his role as the head of the NEU on just a 9% turnout, reportedly. And it's not all about the money, this, is it? 
He said at a Socialist Workers' Party's Marxism conference that strikes were about taking back control of an education system from a brutally racist state. It is much more than about the issue of pay. It is about recognising society, where we are free from racism and free from oppression. Now, he is one of the leaders of the NEU reportedly calling on their 300,000 or so members to actively campaign for Palestine and increase understanding of the conflict. In fact, here is Kabidi at a Palestine rally saying it's time to globalise the Intifada. Let's do it for Palestine, Ramallah, West Bank, Gaza. It's about time we globalise the Intifada. Yeah! Spokesperson for the NEU said, in speaking to the rally, Mr Kabidi called for peace and justice in the Middle East and expressed solidarity with the Palestinian people. He used the slogan, globalise the Intifada, which is an expression of such solidarity and of support for civic protest. It did not convey any support for violence. According to the Cambridge Dictionary, Intifada is a violent act of opposition by the Palestinian people to the Israeli occupation of the West Bank and Gaza Strip. So you can decide for yourself what he really meant. Khabidi thinks the British education system is institutionally racist and we need to decolonise the curriculum. The NEU is we've also been looking at how we can uh, deal with some of the institutional racism that, de that does occur in education. Uh, the curriculum is very Eurocentric. Uh, children are taught this sort of nationalistic um, island nation narrative of British history that doesn't reflect the truth. Um, so we are developing a decolonising agenda inside education and amongst our, our members. Do you really think this is all about pay and teaching conditions? Teacher vacancies in England are currently 93% higher than pre-pandemic levels and despite lowering its recruitment targets, the government has failed to hire enough teachers in the last nine out of ten years, reportedly. But the NEU apparently takes votes on whether or not to impose the expansion of NATO. There we go. Good stuff. What has that got to do with your child's education? Seriously. Now, I have a lot of sympathy for teachers who are overworked and underpaid. I really, really do. But when your child's education is suffering because they can't go to school in September, it's worth remembering that the guy who is fronting up these strikes is a bloke who wants a global intifada to bring down a brutally racist state and thinks we need to decolonise the curriculum. Forgive me, but I'm not sure this is all about paying conditions, really, is it? Let's get the thoughts of my panel this evening. I have got Director of Popular Conservatives, Mark Littlewood. I've got businessman and activist, Adam Brooks, and author and journalist, Rebecca Reid. Matt, I'll start with you, Mark, on this. I mean, the idea now that kids could be taken out of school again because teachers are being led into a strike by a bloke who wants to globalise the Intifada. Doesn't sit that well with me. Doesn't sit that well with me either. There's two different things here, aren't there? The first is his fruitcake lefty politics about NATO and the Middle East and the rest of it. Why the head of a teachers' union in Britain is talking about the Gaza conflict is beyond me. It'd be like Benjamin Netanyahu coming out and pronouncing on NHS waiting lists or something. You'd wonder what the hell is going on here? He, he should stick to his lane, which is about teaching. So it, it is cranky and bananas that you have a teachers' union which is spending so much of its time talking about Palestine, for crying mm. out loud. Um, then you've got to move on to what he actually says about the education system itself. OK, well, that is his lane. And I've got some sympathy, like you have, mm. Patrick, with teachers. I mean, I just looked through before coming on air. There's sort of 87 different pay grades. They're not yeah. well-paid people at all. They do get generous pensions, by the way. Mm. Uh, but the holidays, people but, always say yeah, as well. Uh, the holidays are generous, but they're not well-paid for, for their skill level. But if they want to be, I think we're going to have to make teaching a bit more private sector-like. I was trying to work out and find out how many teachers in Britain have been fired for incompetence, not gross misconduct or sexual assault, just yeah. not been up to the job. Now, National statistics, I believe, are not collated anymore, but in the 40 years, in the four decades to 2010, how many teachers across the country do you think were fired for incompetence? So over 40 years? Over 40 uh, honestly, years. I mean, I can think of a few that I had, it probably should have been, but... Go 18. On. 18. So across sorry, the country. You think the solution to not having enough teachers is to fire more teachers? Absolutely it is. If you want the best people, 
Like in the private sector, you get rid of the chaff and you pay so the So you wheat. don't think that the private sector is because they pay well, because they recruit from universities, because they well, have they an aspirational career? Well, recruit from universities. You but have to have a PTCE. They, they don't go to universities on the milk round recruiting teachers. No, but in the private sector... In the private sector, the they job, do. They come fired. and they give you free I pens, they tell you, come work for us. I possibly believe, Rebecca, that there were only 18 teachers between 1970 and 2010. What I can't possibly believe is that you, think, you can genuinely think that the way to make a really unappealing, hard-work profession which treats people no, badly, the, the way to improve that is to fire more, them. You pay the good people more and you sack And then you'll the have fewer people. teachers. No, you... So, OK, we've got a school of 400 children. Worse, um, just... Nobody's learning math this week because Mark wanted the bad no, no, math no, no, teacher you, fires. No, we, we have to get... How does that work? Well, well, you have to get to schools being run like a kind of small community business. They're on a turnover of about three million quid. We don't have national pay grading for chefs and waiters. We shouldn't have national pay grading for teachers. Well, we do have national pay grading for chefs and waiters and chefs in the NHS in public sector well, organisations. Yeah, but it doesn't do. work. That's why they're always well, in Adam, Adam, all Adam, public want to bring Adam in. The House of Commons, any public... Well, and you get rid of Tony right. if he's not up to the job. I want to bring Adam Teaching in. Teaching needs to be like that. Now, on this, you know, our teachers, if they do go out on strike, led out on strike by this guy who, you know, appears to want to decolonise everything and, mm. you know, striking is, is about, you know, more smashing a racist system. Are they playing roulette with young kids' lives. Yes, and they have been for many years. We, we, what about the, the unions during COVID? I think it was the NEU. They blackmailed the government basically into shutting schools. That was the wrong thing to do. You know, the science proves that was the wrong thing. The government admits it was the wrong thing to do. So many kids now, I think we've got 500,000 children on antidepressants in this country. I mean, a lot of it leads back to COVID as well. Shutting schools, missing education. It, it messed with their minds. But this was the unions that pushed this because they didn't want to go into, in, into, into work during COVID. Now, we, th these NEU, this is a political activist group. Mm. The teachers I know, hardworking, good people, they're not like this fella that runs the union. He, he is a hard left activist. Elected on a 9% turnout. They are nothing well. like this man. Yet he's got the say what they do. And the children are going to suffer. I mean, if this, guy is, if this guy is representing teachers, all right, I mean, this, this is political. This isn't about yes, conditions. But this is political. Unions are political. It, it, it seems so like, the strikes it seems be like a strange intellectual dishonesty to be surprised that a person who has put themselves forward to be the head of a union yeah. might have an agenda. Fine, of but course then they do. Do you think Mitt Lynch school, doesn't care about politics? Your, yeah, fine, but then you're saying that if the kids come out of school in September, they will mm -hmm. be coming out of it because adults who are their teachers are trying to bring down a government. No, because they want better pay and they, don't, and they want the government to pay them properly. But it's not just I about don't the think pay, they... though, is it? It's it about is, smashing it's about a pay... racist no. system. Oh, sorry, do you... On the ballot of things that the teachers are asking for, in the, of, the, of the things they're pushing to the government, where are they asking to smash a racist state? Well, he's just literally re on record. Where? On he's what they on are asking the government saying for. Saying this isn't just about... Where that. are the so... teachers asking what? for a smashing of a racist state? Well, their leader is... You are conflating two completely separate things. The bit that's a bit well, bewildering that... here is, is this, isn't it? I'm rather with you, Adam. This doesn't strike me that this guy represents the mainstream of teachers. not the teachers I know. Why the hell didn't the 91% who didn't fill in their ballot for the leadership election vote, then, for someone who was but a bit more mainstream Remember, and there, there's other unions, not just this union. I think it's the NASUWT, I think, that voted 78% not to take industrial yeah. action. So that proves not all teachers are led... By this but this guy, was, this guy was elected on a 9% yeah, turnout. That's, that's a right. fairly common turnout for well, a leader, though, for these things. People don't really care. Most teachers join a union because they need legal protection in case they're accused of I mean, the the main reason. I was the head of my union. Patrick, am I, am I right care. in saying that teachers got 6.5% pay increase last year? I think, I think so, possibly. But yeah. still, £39,000 average salary when you've, been mm. in a, when, you're, when you've done a three-year degree plus a PGCE and you've been working for yeah. 10 years. But this that is not good money. Fantastic pension. Well, you don't get that until the end of your life. If you're trying to raise a on that, you won't you. have a chance. So you're not off point. during the holidays. That's such a myth. They work through the holidays. That is not true. Okay, so this is so this is a good point, right? Can, how, where are we on whether or not teachers should be paid more? I yes. worked for a teaching charity where they help people from private sector organisations at the top of their career, FTSE 100 companies, become teachers at the end of their career. Every single one of them said to me, this is harder than when I was working in a bank okay. in the city. So, yes, they should be yes, paid more. Yes, they should be paid more. I believe they should be paid more, yep. but I do not believe they should strike and they should hurt but how should children's they get it? futures. How should they get more striking pay without is, striking? Striking is not the action. So, how should they, what should they do? You do not, you do what should not they do? hurt children. Adam, what should they do instead? 
not strike. But what should they do? So, some more individual negotiations, not mm -hmm. national pay bargaining done by some loopy lefty. Individual pay bargaining. Some should be paid a lot more. Some should be paid about what they're paid at the moment, if you're mm -hmm. distinctly average. And some should exit the profession more than are actually exiting at let's the moment. Let's just remember. How without striking let's, do let's, they get that? Let's just remember. No, no, one, no one's put a gun Who? to these teachers' heads and said, you're going to be a teacher. They have decided and trained so to do work? that profession knowing what the yep. pay grade and they say, is. And they say now they've got a recruitment crisis. Which yeah, they because 40,000 teachers left the no profession in 2022. No one put a gun to their head and made them become teachers. Okay, so then what, what happens if they all stop being teachers? Then you don't have any teachers, then you're, all of our children grow up idiots. But we should want that, the best is, people in this country to become that, teachers. They will reflect that like it does in any other How? Sector. How are you measuring output for teachers? Well, you measure on a whole range of things. Are oh, your exam results good? Uh, so are, you take an un... un measured year at a group of well, children, you, think it's impossible you to, are you think not means tested. impossible to distinguish between a good teacher and a terrible teacher. It's, in the, the middle of that, it's, much more, it's can, so much more complicated that? than that. Society, but we do this in every so, other business. No, we make judgments about who deserves a 20% pay rise, who deserves a 5% pay rise, and who deserves a 0% pay rise. That happens in teaching. That happens in teaching. If you become a head of a department, you get a pay rise. Yeah, if you become it's, it's a head of six, you get a pay rise. It's not mad bureaucracy. You get promoted, you get a pay rise. It's on a spreadsheet. It should be the headmaster. Are literally not 87 different There is 87, things. I'll tell you. you, you if you get a promotion, you get a pay rise, but it's still oh, not good money. It's still head teacher, not head master, head teacher. Head teacher. Head teacher. Head teacher. Head teacher. It is a head teacher, not a head master. Stop, or we're going to have to all go home, all right? OK, so... No, sorry, Adam. I know you sat there very patiently, but we are bang out of time, all right? I suppose the NEU... All right, I need to stop laughing now. So... Black young people make up over a quarter of our school student population today. Talking about better support for every black student and the barriers from racism is something Daniel and the NEU are unapologetic about and fully committed to. The General Secretary of the NEU has explained regularly in public that teachers must behave in a non-political manner when teaching. Yeah, when teaching, but obviously if they're coming out for political reasons, then that's something else entirely, isn't it? Coming up, whew, can you spot anything wrong with this from Tory MP Brent Bradley? The council's failing local residents. If you live in a Labour council area, you pay more council tax. You're more likely to have to wait behind non-British nationals for social housing. Labour councillors are calling that video racist. I will find out uh, what my panel make of that. I'll probably have to go to Adam first. He sat there very patiently. But next, reports coming from British jails that Muslim gangs have won the power battle. That's according to the London Bridge attack hero who confronted the Islamist terrorist with a fire extinguisher. So, are our jails just now jihadi training grounds? It's Patrick Christie tonight. We're on GB News. Breakfast, every day from 6am. TfL bosses have come under fire after banning an advert... Oh, God. <laughs> they banned an advert for a comedy show because it had a hot dog on it, because that supposedly promotes obesity. The comedian Ed Gamble has swapped the image of the fast food favourite in favour of a cucumber instead. And there's the cucumber on the plate. So, is the UK turning into a nanny state? Let's talk to former presenter of Fat Families, Steve Miller, and nutritionist Olivia Parry. Good to see you both this morning. Olivia, it's a comedy show. Um, he's not promoting eating hot dogs, is he? Is this just a load of nonsense? The thing is, we have a huge problem with overweight and obesity in this country. We're fourth in Europe. Um, it's big business. Advertising for food companies is big business. They make, you know, they make so much money. You just have to switch on primetime TV to watch, you know, food after food advertisements. And we, it, it's for the youngsters as well who don't have the nutritional education. We're not taught cookery in school anymore. People go to go to college and to university. They don't know how to cook. But and it for, forgive me, to, forgive like, me for jumping in, Olivia. That. Forgive me for jumping in. But the, but the, the whole point with this is it's an advert for a comedy show. Yes, I know. But this is a this is a wider issue. I think it's a load of old tosh. To be quite honest with you. It's a hot dog. In fact, I wish they'd have put onions on the hot dog. A bit of what you fancy won't hurt you. You should eat 80 20 anyway. You know, we talk about a nanny state. I actually think, arguably, we're becoming an authoritarian state. 
opinions banned comedy banned the england flag banned it's like we've got to wear a virtual muzzle gb news is the home of free speech we were created to champion it and we deliver it day in day out free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us our families and of course the british people having challenging conversations to enlighten each other which is why we hear all sides of the argument we are the people's channel we will always stand by the freedom to express yourself on tv radio and online this is gb news britain's news channel I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise and who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. Welcome back to Pantry Christie's tonight. Coming up, tonight's panel will take you through the very first of tomorrow's front pages. But first, Muslims have won the vicious power struggle between British prison gangs, according to the hero of the London Bridge terror attack. Now, convicted murderer Steve Gallant bravely fought off terrorist Usman Khan after he launched his attack back in 2019. And he's now warning that violent Muslim gangs have taken over British prisons. Speaking about his own recent experience in prison, Gallant told The Telegraph, as the Islamists started to grow in number and in strength, the balance of power changed. People who probably wouldn't have ever even thought about converting to Islam began to do so because they thought their chances were better off on their side. It's convert or get hurt stuff, isn't it? And this was backed up by former government adviser Colin Bloom on this show just last month. Islamist gangs, if you want to put it like that, um, uh, Muslim majority gangs, where they will, evidence was given to me and my review, where Qurans were put on the bed of incoming inmates um, with the very clear indication convert or get hurt. I'm delighted to welcome the first of two guests I've got on this tonight. It's retired prison governor Vanessa Freight Harris. Vanessa, thank you very, very much. Would you mind just explaining what your experiences in the prison system were? Are we seeing an increase in people converting to Islam, for example? What's going on? Uh, good evening, Patrick. Thanks for having me on, as usual. But, um, yeah, I mean, this, this isn't a new thing. It has been going on for quite a while. Um, and that's probably because of the number of Muslims that are, are coming into custody. And there is quite a high proportion of Muslim prisoners. Now, there is strong evidence to suggest that prisoners do convert, convert to Islam as a response to controls of power and space in a jail, particularly in the high security estate, because, um, you know, security and safety is, is at a premium when you've got very some very dangerous criminals in, in the likes of Franklin, Whitemore and Belmarsh. So um, I think when you've got large numbers of male prisoners entering into custody, searching for a meaning and a, and a certain belonging mm. that gangs enable this sort of this sort of thing and it does go on yeah absolutely and would you say that then the muslim more hardline muslim gangs are now the dominant gangs in prison and, and should that be a concern for society i think i think it it, it usually uh, mirrors society at prison so if there's um <laughs> in a in a sort of like an inner city jail like in london or birmingham yes that that it would be prevalent that, that it probably is a mm. the majority are, are muslim gangs um, and that's that's just natural but i think um unfortunately frontline staff to deal with this lack um a religious competence they lack leadership support 
and an authority to su su spot and challenge um, behaviour and control issues like this, with obviously a, a fear of racism following mm. them around. Um, and uh, and that is a worry, and I think we should be concerned at that. Look, can, Vanessa, can I just say a massive thank you for coming on and just really shining a light on exactly what is going on inside there. It's great to have had your kind of lived experience of that, really, and I do hope to talk to you again very, very soon. It's former prison governor Vanessa Frake-Harris. Um, I'm going to get the view now um, of executive director of the Henry Jackson Society, Dr Alan Mendoza. Alan, look, thank you very, very much. I suppose the wider question here for society as a whole is whether or not prisons are now being treated as jihadi training grounds. Well, yes, because, of course, the problem isn't simply a prison problem. The problem uh, of conversions and of, you know, jihadism running rife in prisons could emerge at the other end when prisoners are released and go back into society and take their beliefs with them. And that's a big question. Does that radicalization in prison then carry through to civilian life? And if it does, uh, then we indeed have caused a lot of problems by allowing prisons to become these centres. Yeah, indeed. Uh, and, and this is we see all too often, is very, very hard to police against, mainly because it becomes incredibly difficult to tell when someone has actually been de-radicalised, as we've seen with things like the Fishmongers Hall attack, for example. Yes, I mean, the, the biggest problem there was, of course, that, uh, you know, uh, Osman Khan was able to persuade people he had been de-radicalised, when, of course, he hadn't. He was just waiting for one opportunity in order to strike. That's a classic example of why you have to be very careful uh, with the prison environment, why you have to make sure that radicalisation is not occurring. And should it occur, you've got to make absolutely certain that people who are coming out have been de-radicalised, and if not, that you're fully aware of who they are and that you can monitor them accordingly. Now, what Vanessa Freight was saying there was that prison staff don't always lack the correct guidance on how to deal with this. There's a fear of being called racist. There's perhaps as well just a lack of knowledge or willpower in order to be able to deal with it and that the problem is, is somewhat overwhelming. I, I just wonder, why do you think that there is, according to her anyway, a, you know, a disproportionate number of hardline Muslims in prisons and, and, uh, and dare I say, it, in wider society as well? Well, the, the, the Muslim prison population is about three times that's a proportion the size of the Muslim proportion in society. So clearly something's going on there in terms of um, prisoners uh, and the prison population. I think the danger is that at the top end, you've got some very dangerous people who've obviously been uh, in jail for terrorism offences, and they're uh, radicalised hardcore. Some of them will have been there because their bombs didn't blow, blow themselves to oblivion, basically. So when you have people like that, as it were, uh, being the gang leaders, being the people uh, who are the alphas in prison, obviously that's a very dangerous um, sort of place to be, and it can cascade down. I, I know, for example, you know, Steve Gallant speaks of there's a, a, a tail effect on this from Category A prisons even into Category B prisons just because of the numbers that are happening here. So something's going badly wrong here, um, and it needs to be addressed and looked at to make sure that this does not propagate further. Alan, thank you very, very much. Tremendous to have you on the show, and I'll see you very soon. That's uh, Dr Alan Mendoza there. Now, look, a prison service spokesman said this. Staff act swiftly to clamp down on intimidating or threatening behaviour, regardless of cultural or religious sensitivities. And our £100 million investment into tough security measures is helping stop the contraband which fuels violence and gangs behind bars. Yeah, OK, but if it's a religious-based violence, how do you stop that getting in? Coming up, Tory MP Brent Bradley has been likened to the BMP for saying this. For councils failing local residents. If you live in a Labour council area, you pay more council tax. You're more likely to have to wait behind non-British nationals for social housing. Not that offensive? Anyway, my panel debate, if there's anything offensive about that clip. And get ready for a look at tomorrow's newspaper front pages, including is the West only being stirred into action in Gaza because of the deaths of seven aid workers, three of whom were British, and also... As well, apparently, the new leader of Argentina, well, he really does want the Falklands back. I'll see you in a tick. Hello again and welcome to your latest GB News weather update. Well, there will be some further heavy rain first thing across southern areas, but in general, Thursday offers some much drier weather compared to the wet weather we've seen recently. Northeastern areas have suffered the most with the rain throughout today. That rain will clear away through tonight, but the next batch arrives into the southwest. We'll see two bursts of rain. This one will turn heavy at first in the southwest, but as it pushes into parts of northern England, it will turn a little bit dry, but most areas will see some heavy outbreaks. 
outbreaks of rain through the night. Further north and west, though, it should stay dry and we could see a touch of frostbite tomorrow morning. But it's in the southwest tomorrow morning where the heaviest rain will be. And that will push into parts of Wales, the Midlands, into the southeast throughout the rush hour. So if you are moving about on Thursday morning, expect some tricky travelling conditions. Once that does clear out the way, we'll see a mix of sunshine and showers for many areas of England and Wales. There will be some decent sunny spells in between that will feel fairly pleasant in that sunshine. But further north, it's going to considerably drier day than it has been lately. We'll see highs of around 10 or 11 degrees across northwestern areas. It's still cold though in the far north of Scotland and as the next batch of rain bumps into that cold air on Friday morning, there's a risk of some snow across the highlands and Grampians and we'll see outbreaks of quite heavy rain push through many northern areas throughout Friday. Further south though, it turns drier as the day goes on, but the weekend is looking unsettled and seasonably windy, but exceptionally mild. That's all for now. Bye-bye. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan. Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks. The admission's free. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11am on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. This is Patrick Christie's Tonight. We're on GB News and it is time to bring you the very first look at tomorrow's front pages. Let's do it. We start with the sun. Exclusive, they say. PM's vow if boats plan thwarted. Richie, I will quit the Euro Court. Richie Sunak is saying that he will quit the European Court of Human Rights. Do you believe him? Let's go to the Express. PM, we will quit Euro Court if Rwanda flights blocked. It's not that much of an exclusive then, but there we go. Um, so, yes, same, same. Let's go to the Metro now. Uh, intolerable. Rishi's attack condemned... Sorry, sorry, sorry. Israel's attack condemned by Rishi uh, and three Brit families. That is, of course, the story of uh, the airstrike in Gaza. Uh, the eye now. Gaza plunges into new aid crisis. The killing of seven aid workers by Israeli airstrikes has tipped Gaza into a new humanitarian crisis. Charities tell The Guardian. Former Supreme Court judges add voices to calls for Israeli arms ban. I can't just say I'm not entirely surprised at, at that, given that I imagine that quite a lot of former Supreme Court judges do tend to lean to the left, but there we go. Netanyahu faces global outcry over killing of aid workers. Uh, the Independent has got a massive picture story on the front, um, and it is a girl in the ruins of Gaza. Uh, so this is the independence view. So they've, they've, they've devoted their front page to a view, and it says, it may seem wrong that after more than 30,000 Palestinians in Gaza have perished, it took the deaths of just seven international aid workers to stir Western governments into a sense of outrage. But that is the reality. And that's where we're going to start tonight, with, with my press pack. Mark, is there some truth to the idea that because three Brits have died, now more people think well, there should be a ceasefire. No doubt about it. I agree with the independence judgment there. Uh, it's not surprising, though, is it? Because I think when something brings war closer to home, that's how people get impassioned about it. I mean, it sounds incredibly inhumane to sort of say it's a war going on in foreign places of, mm. of which we know little, but there's sort of truth in that until you actually see casualties of people, you know, close to home. So, yes, yeah. it does bring it C back in that I, way. Can I just raise another point here that's on, on the independence front page? Because I think this is quite a telling 
point. I'll come to you on this, Adam. The moment has come to do whatever it takes to force Israel to end its war. Well, I mean, that could be Hamas returning the hostages, couldn't yeah, it? Yeah, why is more not said about... We've got... Uh, I still believe there's British hostages to be released, isn't there? I'm not, I'm not entirely sure if there's British uh, well, hostages. I think maybe certain... people with dual nationality. Yeah. Whether the British yeah. or the yeah. hostages. Yeah, look, more needs to be made of this because we can't forget what happened on October 7th. That was an atrocity. And that has led to what I believe Israel, you could say, overreacting or being a little reckless in what they're doing in yeah, Gaza. There are British hostages, by the way, so there I'm just going in so, now, there are British look, hostages. Look, I'm upset by what happened on October 7th, and I'm also upset that Palestinian children and innocents have died as well. Mm. And I think most normal people will take that balance. And I think now it is hitting home, mm. and maybe the leaders have to come together and say, it's... what is the end game? We yeah. need to know what the end game is here for Rebecca, Israel. Rebecca, is, is there a, a slight forgetfulness that Hamas fire rockets indiscriminately into Israel if there wasn't for the Iron Dome, then that would just mean, I mean, there would be, you know, girls, bless her, you know, like that, but Israeli, or all over Israel. And are we forgetting that? Yeah, and I think Hamas do like to try and use people as human shields. And I think Hamas are pleased by the turning of the public perception that Israel is, and Israel has more power and is mm. using more power. I, I am horrified and disgusted by the death of children on both sides. Yeah. I think there's horrors on both sides. I'm also, I also think it's quite human that sometimes when the suffering is this huge, it takes something smaller, like three British nationals, to focus the mind. I think sometimes you can really lose track of how awful it is. And so I don't think it's surprising that it's mm. taken this to, to refocus people. Yeah, indeed. Um, all right, well, look, we're going we're gonna to park that there now. We had a head-to-head -head on, on that earlier on as well, so you can go back and, uh, and watch that. But um, I'm going to move it on slightly now and just discuss about... Uh, uh, another it's big story is going around. So Brits are routinely spending years on waiting lists for limited mm. social housing as the population continues to grow. We all know this. We cover this regularly on the show. So Conservative MP Ben Bradley waded into the housing debate earlier today. Now, he made this criticism of Labour-run councils. The councils failing local residents. If you live in a Labour council area, you pay more council tax. You're more likely to be a victim of crime. You're more likely to experience fly tipping. You're more likely to have to wait behind non-British nationals for social housing. Their record is terrible. OK, so that's what he said there. I mean, people online, the usual types there, were all saying, I thought something the BMP would say there. But, Rebecca, you, you disagree with what he's saying there. I mean, I didn't even get as far as the housing bit before I was cross because he has said something that is fundamentally, provably untrue. So I think the second statement he makes is, if you live in a, under a Labour-run council, you pay more council tax. Now, that's just not true. You pay, on average, th around £300 less in a Labour-run council than you would in a Tory one. And also, one of the lowest council tax boroughs in the whole of the UK is Wandsworth, which is Labour and has been Labour for many years. So while I do think there is a dog whistle here and I don't like that, what I actually hate more is reputable, in theory, politicians mm. saying things that are not true with no recourse. There, there is, though, Adam, I think a very... Well, so something that is true is that there are Brits waiting behind foreign mm. nationals on housing waiting lists. That's undeniable. There's anecdotes from my area of, of people whose relatives are waiting for a council house can't get one, yet... Regularly, you're seeing new foreign families moving into the area. Maybe we should on, have on, sold them all. On to the council estates. Now, at the end of the day, pro, um, social housing is done on priority. And the priority is if someone is homeless. Now, if you're suddenly importing, allowing 120,000 to be rubber-stamped asylum, leave to stay in this country, they've got no house, they've got no assets, they have to be housed. So they are technically homeless and they are going to jump in front of Dave and Sue that are staying at their friends or their relatives. That's undeniable. He's right. But the mm. need that it's assessed on is having children, so you wouldn't... Uh, a single economic migrant man would never jump well, over a family, family with children. Si family size is one the, of the considerations. The, the, the main, the main one, thing is children. But, but also imminent risk of homelessness. So if you're in a migrant mm. hotel... But children is number one. If you, yeah, fine. But if you're, if you're in a migrant hotel and you are given 28 days to leave, then it, it does follow. You are <laughs> then off yes, the but no, no family is not having a home because an economic migrant man is being given a home. But one of the problems is that quite often those people who are families, they're not already living in hostels, they are living with people. Mm. They just don't have their but own homes. I, I don't think... So, some of the viewers probably won't realise that some London boroughs, mm. up to 50% of social housing is from foreign-born people. 
this is crazy. S Southwark, I know, ranks incredibly badly when it comes to that. Mark, you've heard what Ben Bradley's yep. had to say now. Was he wrong to say that stuff? Well, hang on. I mean, a rare point of potentially being a bit of myself. I think, actually, there are some factual inaccuracies mm. in what he says. But I, I know Bren Ben Bradley a bit. I don't know him well, but I've broken bread with him and had a few jars with him. I can assure you there's not a racist bone in that man's body. Uh, and what I worry about, if he's got something factually incorrect, he should be corrected on it. Uh, Wandsworth, by the way, is only recently Labour. It's been Conservative for donkey's years. Mm. Labour took it at the last election. It's historically had... Quite a long low... time, the last election, though. Well, f three years ago. I think it was Conservative for 30 years up to that point. Um, it, uh, Labour recently won it. But it, it doesn't matter if you get these factual things wrong. This is what worries me, Patrick. Let's say he's made a, a, a precise technical error on some point. Mm. He should be corrected on it. But... The idea that he's a racist or speaking yeah. like the British National Party, this is just complete nonsense. Uh, politicians need to put forward their views. If they misspeak or get the facts technically wrong, they should be corrected. But they should not be pilloried mm. as if they're trying to make some dog whistle racist statement. I hate this term dog whistle. It treats the electorate like dogs mm. uh, that you're sort of whistling and trying to appeal to. If you make an error, correct it. it maybe he's made a technical error, but the man is not a racist. But uh, do you not think it's fair, like, for me, the one value of conservatism that I like is this idea that you can sort yourself out. You're not a victim. Do the work. Make it work. Mm -hmm. And this kind of people have come over, they've taken from you. You don't have something because somebody's taken it away from you. Yeah, but That's there's such a, a non-conservative value. There is a shortage of housing. That is a fact. Because but of the immigration numbers that we have got. And also because they sold all of the council it, houses. We, yeah, but we've, we're even housing people that had their asylum um, claims rejected because I think it's ECHR ruling Article 8. We have to house them. But only 8% of new housing goes to foreign nationals in, the, in this country. Between 8 and 10% is the figure. Yeah, so 90 to 92% is not going to foreign-born nationals. But it's, it's so there is clearly still not enough housing, even if you got rid of that 8%. Yeah, there is still dramatically not enough housing. I was just saying, what that doesn't also include in that figure are people who are the children of foreign-born nationals. Mm. So yeah, because they're who... British. If they're born here, they're British. Yeah, fine, but I think that's also another question to be had, isn't it, which is that if you come over to this country and you are an immigrant and you are given a house and then your child or also then clogs up the social housing waiting yeah, list. Exactly. Is that not also a problem? But, but we're going to pocket But those problem. are British people. Yeah, they are British people, but... They, that is a yeah, problem, but it's, it's a different problem. problem. It's, it's undeniable that immigration is making the housing system worse. OK, fine, fine, fine. Now, Taiwan has been struck by a terrifying earthquake, registering 7.4 on the Richter scale. And while the quake has sadly claimed the lives of several people, this chap remained unbelievably calm as the tremors caused the pool he was swimming in to tip from side to side in scenes that simply cannot imagine here in the UK. I mean, goodness gracious me, a timely reminder of the frightening power of nature. I mean, he's a braver man than me, I'll tell you that much. Although maybe he's safer in the pool. I don't know. I don't know. Anyway, coming up, after woke Team GB desecrate the Union Jack, a senior Tory MP wants a minister for the Union flag and other national emblems. Is this how we resist the constant erosion of the British identity? My panel have their say. Plus, more of tomorrow's newspaper front pages and the Argentinian president says that he has a plan for taking the Falklands back. I think they tried that once. I'll see you in a sec. Farage, Monday to Thursday from 7pm. The big thing here, Tom, is is it actually even credible or possible that by 2030 we're going to have carbon If we wanted neutral. to do it, is it an engineering possibility? Yes. Mm. Could we do it if we wanted to? Yes, we could. But, but so far, we're not on course to doing it. But, um, this government has not done a particularly good job of trying to of doing what we could do if we set our mind to it. The question remains to be seen whether a Labour government would do better. You see, I wonder whether the only way you could even get anywhere near this is just to import more energy. And when we import stuff... We say, oh, oh, oh that's, that's, there's no carbon dioxide emissions. So really, I just wonder, and it's a bit like steel making and many other arguments, aren't we just conning ourselves? Well, I don't think we're conning ourselves. I think we're not putting in the effort we need to get to where we say we want to get to. And 
you know, we can do this stupidly or we can do it smartly. And you and I have talked before about, yeah. well, if you build nuclear power stations, that's not a very smart way to do it. If you insulate... Well, people, well, well but, 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 that, you say that. Yeah, go on. Well, you didn't disagree <laughs> with me, as I recall. Uh, my worry <laughs> was... Maybe no, changing I mean, your mind. You're allowed look, to do look, that. Look, look, nuclear's fine, but we ain't going to have it by 2030. You know, that's absolutely true. We yeah. certainly yeah. can agree about that. The, the key real thing is, what can you do fastest and quickest that will give drive people's bills down soonest? And that, for an incoming Labour government, driving bills down and incomes up will be their core priority. So what can you do? Well, the first thing you need to do is make every single building in this country leak tight because we we've got the Sorry? New build. No, every single building. And new buildings, all the buildings we've got, they should be critical national infrastructure. They're the leakiest buildings in Europe. That really reduces our competitiveness. I'm talking about not just homes, I'm also talking about uh, all of our small and medium-sized enterprises where growth is going to come from. Welcome back. I've got some more of the front pages for you. Let's do it. The Times goes with blood tests to help spot Alzheimer's years earlier. Trials will track thousands with memory loss, so thousands of Brits who are worried about their memory are set to receive blood tests for dementia. Um, PM refuses to rule out halting arms sales to Israel as well. Let's go to the Telegraph. Judges to look at soft terms for deprived offenders. Critics say the guidance from Sentencing Council is patronising and inaccurate. Um, the Sentencing Council is essentially going to look at whether or not there are mitigating factors such as a poor upbringing in someone's sentencing. If you ask me, it's another excuse to not send people to prison, but there we go. The Daily Mail. MPs caught up in naked honey trap sexting. Now we're talking, right. <laughs> Serving minister among those feared to have been targeted by hostile state. At least a dozen MPs, their staff members and political journalists... Oh, hang on a minute. <laughs> Actually, we'll, we'll leave that one there. No. And political journalists have been targeted in a sinister cyber honey trap scandal. Parliamentary authorities, I'm just going to keep reading this, are under pressure to investigate after a string of Westminster figures, including a serving minister, were sent flirtation messages and naked pictures. Victims have voiced concerns that those behind the spear phishing attacks seem to have intimate knowledge of their lives and movements. And there are fears that a foreign state may be involved. Well, well. Well, well, well. I wonder who will come out in the wash there. The Mirror. Killed trying to feed starving kids. Very much a shift in tone on the mirror here. Brits are among the victims of a merciless Israeli drone strike. Right, so those are all of your front pages, I get the impression we might be hearing quite a lot about what's on the front of the Daily Mail tomorrow, but I'm joined by my press pack, director, popular conservatives Mark Littlewood, businessman and activist Adam Brooks, and author and journalist Rebecca Reid. Now, controversial Argentinian president Javier Millet has vowed to establish a diplomatic roadmap for the United Kingdom to hand back the Falkland Islands to Argentina. Hand back. Anyway, Millet criticised previous administrations and promised to develop... So he's promised this to develop a plan to return the territory in a speech that could spark tensions with Westminster. Uh, Mark, they tried this once, didn't they? Yeah, this isn't going to happen, Patrick. Uh, the reason that you know it's not going to happen is any political programme which is described as either a roadmap or a framework goes absolutely nowhere. Uh, so this is um, posturing, really, by Millet. By the way, I've got a lot of sympathy with him in, in general terms yeah. in, his, in his efforts like around the, the Argentinian economy. I think, uh, you know, I'm thinking of buying stock in Argentina, actually, because uh, he could turn that around. But this isn't going to go anywhere. There's absolute unanimity. I think across yeah. the political parties in the UK, there will be, this will be no darts. And if we hold another referendum there, it's not going to be 52 48, is yeah. it? It's going to be 99.9% .9 to stay uh, aligned with the UK. I have a huge amount of time, Fabio Malay. I think quite a lot mm. of people do. And I suspect, slash hope, that really he's, he's saying what he knows is probably popular in Argentina and this is political. Not going to go uh, anywhere. Let's, let's remember British soldiers died on that island. Yeah. There's no way it's going back. No, there isn't. No, there absolutely isn't. And mm. I do think we would go to war over it again. Mm. Yeah. And so we should, no disrespect. It won't come to that, it won't come to that, I'm confident. No, um, I think we can just have a... So, Mark, Javier Malay's been on, he's heard what you've had to say, and he's got a little message for you. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, he's all right. I mean, he's a bit understated, isn't he? But, <laughs> but, uh, but other than that, he's on the right track, in my view. Re Rebecca, you want to give the Falkland Islands back to that man. <laughs> and you know what? Since my subsequent 
Hill I decided to die on was Give Back the Falklands. I did a lot more reading, and it transpires we should not give back the Falklands. Oh, there we oh, go. No. So, no, right. we you were scared of that, wasn't you? I, I'm we... scared of him putting a chainsaw near a woman's head. I think that shows very bad leadership. Yeah, look, lot of time, lot of time for him. But I think he's, I think he's wrong on this one. Now, look, uh, Tory MP and chair of a parliamentary committee on flags and heraldry. Henry Smith has waded into a blistering row over Team GB's butchering of the traditional Union Jack flag by endorsing the suggestion of an eminent flag expert. We don't have what you might call a national symbols officer, so who could expect to be consulted about things like changing the flag for use at the Olympics yeah. and basically sort of say no. And this could be a Home Office minister could have this added to their brief. Graham's um, idea is something we've discussed in the past. Yeah. It is, is very important. As it wouldn't cost any more. It would just fix a point of responsibility in government to make sure that our national symbols are protected. Mark, with respect, do we need a minister for flags? Can't the existing ministers just say stop messing about this with flags? This is flag? absolutely bonkers. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the number of different ministers we've got now. Do you remember it was a few years ago that they created the Minister for Loneliness? Yeah. And everybody said, why aren't there two of them? You can't oh, just have one oh, Minister no. for Loneliness. A Can Minister I just ask for something? Flags. A Minister for Flags, you do not need this. What you need is the Department of Culture, Media and Sport to say, yeah. if you get a grant from the government and you're officially representing the GB team or the Scottish team or the, yeah. or the English team, this is the heraldry you need to wear, otherwise you don't get any money. Can we just all have a little look behind Mark at that nice screen that says Patrick Christie's tonight? Yes. Now, is that the true representation of the but we're not, Jack no, behind them? So, but no, when no, Nike, no, when no, Nike did it, everyone lost their no, 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 mind. No, no, no. They, they, they are the right colours. Yeah. The, the one that's entirely blue is the right colour. They are the right yeah. colours. The whole so thing. The one that's entirely thing blue is the, is the right, right, right colour. Because, because, because you are, but remarkably, not the first person to make it say, we are not sending teams into sports or battle to represent Great Britain wearing the Colours what about when the Tory part? What about okay. when the Tory party right. made it all blue so, and made yeah. it the background? Fine. The Tory party had made the, the it all blue yeah. multiple times. Exactly. But I'm just saying that is not the but, gotcha moment that you. And you're not subsidised by the state, Patrick, as far as I'm aware. We don't need a minister for flags, right. but we sh we should have a minister for common sense. We do. It's SM different, at vague. The different yeah. departments go to and double check things like this because they can't keep messing okay. with our flags. Our former right, colleague SM at is supposed to do that. We've got two minutes left, so we're going to have to reveal tonight's greatest Britain Union jackass. Very quickly, who's your greatest Briton, Mark? Andrew Rossendale on your show the other night, Patrick. First politician to really open up the debate about the NHS. Good on him. Let's, Top hear, man. From, let's hear from Rosa. Spending more on the NHS today than ever before. But there are still problems with it because it is a monopoly, because it's a centralised bureaucracy, because the management isn't working as it should. There is a lot wrong with the health service. Good stuff. All right, go on. I couldn't go for J.K. Rowling, so I've gone for an honorary nomination of US swimmer Riley Gaines, who has been fighting against the trans ideology in America, speaking a lot of common sense and sticking up for women's rights. Good stuff. OK, go on, Rebecca. My name's a Labour councillor who, for Valentine's Ward, who fact-checked ben, ben Bradley's video and pointed out all the inaccuracies. OK, all right, very topical. That's Alex Holmes, apparently, there. OK, today's Greatest Britain is... Rosa! There we go. OK, well done, Andrew Rosendale. Right, who is the Union Jackass? I could pick them every week, Patrick. HMRC. Uh, <laughs> I could pick them every week. I mean... but, but the reason I'm picking them today is they have the lowest occupancy rates of any uh... government department, about 50%, despite the fact there's the biggest tax burden in history. If they've only got a 50% occupancy rate, sell off half the office and oh. probably sack off the staff. All right, go on, Adam. My nomination is the NEU um, T Teachers union leaders who bragged about saving lives during COVID by the school closures. Mm. Uh, they were wrong. And they're and about to strike again, apparently. It damaged a lot of children. OK, go on, Rebecca. Mine is Henry Smith for suggesting that we need a flag minister. We don't have a minister for men, even though suicide is the biggest killer yeah. of men under a certain age. But apparently we need one for flags. Yeah, no, I do agree. As much as, you know, and we've had this debate quite a lot in recent days here, not just on this show, but on this channel, and everyone has really, haven't they, Billy? Uh, I, I do not think we do need a minister for flags. I think we just need someone to, to not mess around with it and say that. Anyway, today's Union Jackass is... The NEU leaders, yes, in case you missed it, I would urge you to just go back and re-watch, rewind if you're watching on Catch Up on YouTube, the top of the 10 o'clock hour where it looks as though the National Education Union, led by a hard-left 
Marxist sympathising individual uh, wants to take your kids out of school, apparently, just in time for the new school year. So there we go. Right, massive thank you to my wonderful panel. I've really enjoyed it this evening. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, headliners are up next. They're going to take a more in-depth or slightly comedic, I think it was fair to say as well, uh, look at all of tomorrow's newspaper front pages. I'll be back tomorrow from 9pm with some more rip-roaring stuff for you. Until then, everybody, keep fighting the good fight. See you at 9. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar, sponsors of weather on GB News. Hello again and welcome to your latest GB News weather update. Well, there will be some further heavy rain first thing across southern areas, but in general, Thursday offers some much drier weather compared to the wet weather we've seen recently. Northeastern areas have suffered the most with the rain throughout today. That rain will clear away through tonight, but the next batch arrives into the southwest. We'll see two bursts of rain. This one will turn heavy at first in the southwest, but as it pushes into parts of northern England, it will turn a little bit dry, but most areas will see some heavy outbreaks rates of rain through the night. Further north and west though it should stay dry and we could see a touch of frostbite tomorrow morning but it's in the southwest tomorrow morning where the heaviest rain will be and that will push into parts of Wales, the Midlands, into the southeast throughout the rush hour. So if you are moving about on Thursday morning expect some tricky travelling conditions. Once that does clear out the way we'll see a mix of sunshine and showers for many areas of England and Wales. There will be some decent sunny spells in between that will feel fairly pleasant in that sunshine but further north it's going to considerably drier day than it has been lately. We'll see highs of around 10 or 11 degrees across northwestern areas. It's still cold though in the far north of Scotland and as the next batch of rain bumps into that cold air on Friday morning there's a risk of some snow across the highlands and Grampians and we'll see outbreaks of quite heavy rain push through many northern areas throughout Friday. Further south though it turns drier as the day goes on but the weekend is looking unsettled and seasonably windy but exceptionally mild. That's all for now. Bye-bye. That warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers, sponsors of weather on GB News. You can win our biggest prize giveaway so far. First, there's an incredible £10,000 in tax-free cash to spend however you like. Plus, courtesy of Variety Cruises, a bespoke seven-night small boat cruise for two worth £10,000. With flights, meals, excursions and drinks included, your next holiday could be on us. Choose any one of their 2025 Greek adventures and find your home at sea. We'll also send you packing with these luxury travel gifts. For a chance to win a prize worth over £20,000, text PRIZE to 63232. Text costs £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB04, PO Box 8690, Derby DE1 9 T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on the 26th of April. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if listening or watching on demand. Good luck. Britain's Newsroom, weekday mornings from 9.30. One more story in. Uh, Milton Keynes, absolute chaos in the city. 300 odd youths arrested or at least involved in a, uh, a, a stampede. A stampede. Yeah, a stampede. What, what's been going on? A stampede through the. Uh, there we are. This is the video. So this is a stampede through a uh, shopping centre in Milton Keynes. I think, Amy, you live there, don't you? You live nearby. For, those, live, on, for those on radio, we can see literally hundreds, scores of kids. I think kids. they're about 300 kids. Are they in school uniforms? So, yeah, quite oh, yeah. Um, This is as they've security, broken up from school, presumably. Security tried to intervene. They've been accused of being heavy-handed. But I think this speaks to the fact that the landscape of youth services has just been decimated and there's literally nothing for kids. So, hang on, whoa, whoa, whoa. You think that this has happened because social moment. services have been diluted? Youth services. This is because there's no police around, there's no oversight, there's no deterrent, and 300 kids think that they can run through a shopping centre, Why frightening shoppers out of their kids lives. Going to a shopping centre. Amy, center? sorry, my kids, my kids would not be behaving like that because there's no ping pong available at the local centre. And yeah. your kids are like age four and five. These are teenagers, and our teenagers are headed into a world where there are no leisure services. Oh, there 
have nothing to do with crime. Who, who? If we up the ante on basketball, it's not going to stop kids being stabbed on the street. What creates antisocial behaviour is having nothing to no, do. It's lack of discipline in the alienated. home, lack of discipline in the home, and lack of policing on the what streets, and think? and a judiciary and a penal system that is utterly liberal. You're going right to the end of the line. What about the preventative? But measures? what about the people that these people affect?